It was perfect. And in fact, Genesis 2, 1, the very next verse says, and the creation was finished. It's the equivalent in the Hebrew of our English past definite tense, indicating an action once forever completed in the past, not to occur again in the future. It was done, it was finished, and it was perfect. Question. According to the text, on what day was man created? Day six. And on what days were the animals created? Wasn't days one, two, three, or four, was it? Because on those days, it was the earth, the heavens, light, darkness, plants, waters, heavenly bodies. Ladies and gentlemen, there were no animals created till days five and six. So, for the sake of argument, let's assume that dinosaurs were created as early as possible during the creation week. That would be day five, first day any living animals were made. Now, actually, they fit in day six. But for the sake of argument, let's push them back to day five. If the dinosaurs had been made on day five, if man were made on day six, as the text indicated that he was, you tell me, how many days separated the men and the dinosaurs? One. This is not rocket science. Folks, this is easy to understand. A child can understand this. God made it so we can understand it. But what's happened is, some of us adults have come along and we've made it hard to understand. I've had people tell me, maybe you've had them say this to you as well, and I've never judged their motives. Perhaps their motives are as pure as the do in snow. Well, I know that's what the Bible says, but that's not what the Bible means. Folks, anytime someone says that to me, I have little flashing lights that start blinking, little bells that clang, and flags that wave. My immediate reaction to someone who says, well, that's what the Bible says, but that's not what it means, is this. Why in the world would God have any trouble telling you what he meant? What, he couldn't create the language you could understand? Couldn't create you so that you could understand the language he created? What's the problem here? And when I ask, well, what does it mean then? It says God did it in six days, but you're saying it doesn't mean that. What does it mean? The response I'm given more often than not is this. Well, it says God did it in six days, but what it really means is God did it in six long, vast, indefinite geological epochs or ages of time. In fact, it's called the day-age theory. A day isn't 24 hours. A day is a long geological epoch of millions of billions of years. So day one was millions of billions, day two was millions, and so forth. Friends, I'm not going to dwell on it at great length this afternoon because there are a number of handouts in the four years that will tell you, but I simply want to say at this point, especially for our youngsters, this idea is wrong. It has always been wrong and can be easily proven to be wrong. Did you ever notice the very first time that God ever used that little Hebrew word day? It's the word yom, Y-O-M was Genesis chapter 1, verse 5. But he didn't just use it. He used it and he defined it. Did you ever notice? It says it was evening and morning, the first yom, the first day. What was a period of, of a day, God? What was it? He said it was a period of evening and morning. How did the Hebrews count time? Sunset to sunset. How do we count time? Midnight to midnight. Is there any difference in the time period being counted? No. They count it from sunset to sunset. We count it from midnight to midnight. How did they write? They wrote from right to left. How do we write? Left to right. I don't know why they did everything backwards. But friends, one thing I do know, when God defined this phrase and modified it by evening and morning, if you will check throughout the whole of the Old Testament in all the non prophetical literature like Genesis, not once will you ever find the word day, dome, used with that phrase evening and morning to mean anything more than 24 hours. Never. Not once. Secondly, did you notice in Genesis 1.14, God is talking about Moses, about what he's done, uh, about the heavenly bodies and their creation, and he said regarding the stars, the moon, the sun, he said, these shall be to you for signs and for seasons, listen to him, for days and for years. Folks, if a day isn't 24 hours, but it's multiplied billions and millions of years, pray tell, what is a year? 
the whole interpretation of Scripture collapses when you try to rearrange what God was trying to say. Think about it. After day three, it says God created on that day the plant. But the insects could not have been created until day five. That was the first day any living things were made that were animals or insects. How are plants going to live? Did you ever notice on Genesis chapter 1, on day 3, it says it was a period of evening and morning? If there were billions of years, that means you've got morning, billions of years of total light, and evening, billions of years of total darkness. How are you going to have plants that live through billions of years of total darkness? Their photosynthetic apparatus can't function. They die. How are the plants going to cross-pollinate that require insects? If the insects weren't created until day five, but the plants were made on day three, folks, how are you going to do that? There's no way to do it. Over and over and over again, God made it crystal clear. These were not anything but 24-hour days. Some time ago, I was in Macon, Georgia, on the campus of Mercer University. I was giving a lecture to a group of university students on one of the campus auditoriums, and I was dealing with the age of the earth specifically, and at the end of it, I dealt with some of the biblical aspects, especially the day age theory. And when I hit this particular point, there was a young man sitting on the end of the pew about halfway back. And when I hit this, he began to squirm in his chair, and you could tell what I was saying wasn't hitting him very well. And by the time I finished, his face was flushed red with anger. And when I called for questions from the audience, his was the first hand to go up. In fact, he didn't just put his hand up. He stood up out of his chair, barely waited for me to call on him, shook his fist defiantly at me and said, I don't like what you've just said. He said, I don't like it one little bit. He said, and I'll tell you why. He said, I consider myself a Bible-believing Christian. And he said, number one, God could have done this any way he chose. And number two, you have limited God. I said, whoa, wait, wait a minute. Time out of second. I said, before you go any further, let's talk about those two points. Number one, young man, the first point you've made that God could have done this any way he chose, I couldn't agree with you more. I said, you and I are in 100% agreement on that. You and I weren't there to tell God how he could or could not have done it, and if we had it, then we still would have kept our mouth shut. God could do it in six days. He could do it in six trillion years. He could do it in the twinkling of an eye, couldn't he? Isn't he omnipotent? Has all power? Yes. I said, young man, I couldn't agree with you more. You're right. I am a little curious, I said. Why would you bring that up in the middle of this discussion when it has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about? And he said, what do you mean? Nothing has everything to do. I said, no, it doesn't. Didn't I just understand you to say that you considered yourself a Bible-believing Christian? Isn't that what you just said? And he stuck out his chest with a measure of pride and said, yes, sir. I said, that's better than it, doesn't it? It has nothing whatsoever to do with what God could have done. It has to do with what does the mind of God through the word of God say God did. Folks, it has nothing to do with what God could have done. That is totally irrelevant. It has to do with what did God say God did. Well, he said he did it in six days. The young man said, you limited God. I most certainly did. I limited him to what he said he did. I don't have any choice in that matter. Isn't that the very point Jesus was trying to get across in John 12, 48, when he said, by these words you will one day stand judged? Folks, this isn't my word. It isn't your word. Neither you nor I has the right, the authority, to tinker with it, tamper with it, alter it in any way. We cannot add to it, delete from it, or anything else. And isn't it true that the injunctions against those people who try from the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament all the way to the book of Revelation in the New are serious indeed. Why? Because it is my word. Did I limit God to what he said he is? Absolutely. Because that's what he told me to do. I said to the young man, I've got a question for you just out of sheer curiosity on my part. What's wrong with God having done it in six days? You just said he could do it any way he wanted. What's wrong with him having done it in six days? And bless his heart, he was so angry before his mind could connect to his mouth, he let it slip. He said, yeah, well, if that's right, there's not enough time for it. And then he quit, right in the middle of his sentence, realizing what he was about to say. 
before he could sit down and draw another breath, I finished the sentence for him. Oh, you mean there's not enough time for evolution to have occurred? He wasn't what he claimed to be. He claimed to be a Bible-believing Christian. He was not. He was a theistic evolutionist. And ladies and gentlemen, you mark my words today, there is a lot of difference in those two groups. The Bible-believing Christian takes God's word. God said he did it, that settles it. The theistic evolutionist, that never settles it. He says, well, that's not what the Bible means. He wants to accept a little bit of evolution, a little bit of the Bible, and sort of mix them together and just go merrily on his way. Friends, let me point out to you today, it is an either-or situation, not a both-and. You either believe in evolution or you believe in creation. You don't believe in both of them. May I remind you also that evolution was invented in the first place to get around the biblical doctrine of creation. You're not going to be able to take evolution and stick it back in the Bible without the destruction of both. Question, according to the Bible, how did man get here? God took a handful of earth, as it were, fashioned it into a man, breathed into it a spirit, and man became a living soul. According to evolution, how did man get here? Well, we're the ultimate end result of a blind, meandering, random chance process of billions of years, and we evolved from some ape-like creature in the forests of Africa roughly three and a half million years ago. Anything alike in both those so you could believe them at the same time? No. According to the Bible, what happens when you die? Oh, that's just the beginning. Folks, our souls are immortal. There's yet an eternity to come. What happens to you according to evolution? You live, you die, end of story. When you die, you're dead like rovers. You're dead all over. That's it. Folks, there is nothing after this life. Is there anything alike in those two so you could believe both of them? No. According to the Bible, was there ever a global flood? Oh, absolutely. Genesis 1, uh, Genesis 6, rather, uh, 1 Peter 3, 2 Peter 3, Matthew 24, all talk about it. According to evolution, was there ever a flood on this earth? A global flood? No, absolutely not. Friends, how can we accept people, ex expect people to believe both of these when they're totally contradictory? The young man saw if what I was saying was from the Bible correct, he couldn't hold to that view anymore. He went away on that occasion much like the rich young ruler who had spoken to Jesus. He knew the truth, but he was very sad at learning it. You cannot believe both the Bible and evolution at the same time. You cannot do it. And I am convinced our youngsters are smart enough to figure that out. And eventually, which one do you think they're going to give up? Belief in evolution or belief in the Bible? The one they have not been given the evidence for. That's the one they're going to give up. This afternoon, one last question comes to mind very quickly. What happened to the dinosaurs? Where did they go? Why don't we apparently have them here today? Well, that's the question everybody wants the answer to, so let's just answer it. Right here, right now, straightforwardly, forthrightly, we can tell you. The dinosaurs... Oh. I'm sorry, we're out of time. Well, I guess if you want to know what happened to the dinosaurs, there's one way to find out. You'll have to react to it at 3 30. <laughs> Don't you just hate it when they do that to you? <laughs> Folks, look, this really isn't that bad. Your favorite television program come this May is going to dump you, and it's not going to pick you back up till September. This is just one hour. <laughs> We're going to start the next lecture by asking and answering that question What happened to the dinosaurs? Where'd they go? And as I promised last evening, I'm going to tie to it a medley of matters that ask questions like these and provide answers. How old is the earth from the biblical standpoint? Where does the global flood fit into all of this? Uh, what about the intelligence of early man, cave man, that we've heard so much about? Uh, how did we all, if we came from an original human ancestor, turn out to be different colors? Some of us black, some white, some red, some yellow, some brown, and literally everything in between. All of those kinds of things we're going to deal with in the next lecture. But before we take a break, let me mention two things to you very quickly. Number one, as you exit after this lecture, if you want them, please go to the back tables in the foyer to your right and get the handout material. Those are not the same as the ones that were there last evening. That's the new material for this afternoon. 
And would you do me a favor? Would you do that first before you do anything else? Because that will let you get away from the table and give me some room to work because as soon as you finish that, I'm going to come back there, put all those up, and get out two whole new tables of handouts for the next lecture. 